Anyone who's ever read a detective story knows that appearances can be deceptive. Just over 700 years ago, this innocent piece of land was witness to a brutal murder that changed the course of Scottish history forever. In May 1297, the Sheriff of Lanark, Sir William Hesselrig, was hacked to death here by a young Scottish patriot. His name, William Wallace, or as we've come to know him, Braveheart. Wallace was a legend, a national hero. But I've come here to try to find the man behind the legend. If you've ever watched the movie Braveheart, forget it. It's a great piece of entertainment, but not an accurate guide. I've come to central Scotland to find the truth about Wallace. Underneath schools and factories and housing estates lies a trail of blood. But whether it leads to a hero or a villain depends on where you come from. Wallace was the first Scottish champion in the vicious wars of independence from England. He's a Scottish icon to this day, but he was certainly no saint. Wallace was a freedom fighter par excellence and was there for his country when his country needed them. He is accused of getting choirs of naked Englishmen and women to sing for him. This was, this was particularly dreadful. He was an underdog, a second son of a, an unimportant knight, and yet he had something in him which people responded to. He must have been an extraordinary man. He, we should never have heard of William Wallace. And we might not have done, except for an accident of history. When Wallace was born, there was no war with England. Scotland was prosperous. Life was good. Then, disaster struck. The night of the 19th of March, 1286, was stormy. The Scottish King, Alexander III, had been carousing at a function in Edinburgh Castle. Late at night, and probably the worse for wear, he ignored his courtier's advice and insisted on returning home to King Hall on the other side of the Firth of Forth. He just married a beautiful French princess half his age. In driving rain and pitch darkness, he set off along the coastal path for his marriage bed. But whether it was a midlife crisis or a noble desire to perform his kingly duties, it was the death of him. Somewhere along the way, his men lost him and his horse stumbled and fell. Later on, he was found here, with his neck broken. 600 years later, the Victorians put up this monument to mark the event. It says, without a hint of irony, that it was erected on the sexcentenary of his death. Seldom has libido proved so costly. When Alexander's only heir also died, Scotland was thrown into crisis. Powerful rival factions took to arms, and the country slid towards civil war. Without a leader, it was going to be chaos. A king is going to have to be chosen. Now, in theory, God chooses kings, but in this case, there's going to have to be some sort of earthly <laughs> intervention. It couldn't happen within Scotland, because that would imply the Scottish nobility are superior to the king. It's got to be a great international figure. And Edward I, Scotland's nearest neighbour, great reputation in Europe. He's the man to do it. They'd asked the wrong man. Edward I was a ruthless expansionist. He'd already annexed Wales and Ireland. The crisis gave him the chance to bring Scotland into his empire. Under the pretext of preventing civil war, Edward took control of Scotland. At Norham Castle, he made the Scottish nobles acknowledge him as their feudal overlord the medieval equivalent of Mafia Doms acknowledging a supreme boss. It meant that when John Balliol was named king, he was Edward's puppet. But while the Scottish nobles caved in, the common people remained defiant. Resistance leaders emerged from nowhere. Throughout Scotland, there were spontaneous attacks on the hated occupying forces. It's about this time that tales of a fierce young Scot called William Wallace began to circulate. One typical story has Wallace fishing in a river when suddenly five English soldiers turn up and demand his catch. 
And Wallace says, you must be joking, but offers them half anyway. And one of the English soldiers is so furious that a mere jock should give him cheek that he draws his sword and lunges at Wallace. Wallace immediately parries with his fishing pole, snatches the man's sword and lops his head off. Then he kills two of the other soldiers before the others escape. Who was this Wallace, everyone was asking. We still don't know what he looked like. These pictures are from much more recent times. The only clues we have to his appearance are the accounts which tell of an arrow scar on his neck and a general agreement that he was enormous, perhaps six foot six or more. He was also much younger than this, about 26. But where had he come from? Well, a Scottish chronicler called Blind Harry tells us that the de Wallis family, which means they were originally from Wales, settled in Eldersley, just south of Glasgow. On the flimsiest of evidence, the good old Victorians did what they do best and erected a monument. But now, archaeology has backed up tradition. So what would have been on this site when Wallace was alive? Well, this is the site where Wallace first saw the light of day and there would have been a fortification here. Uh, there was an archaeological dig done in, in 1998. Uh, there's a hedge that runs right round the site here and yeah. it shows the outline of the original wooden palisade that would have uh, surrounded the fortified property. When you say uh, fortified property, what would it have looked like? Uh, there would have been a hall house of some sort, either made of timber or stone, uh, surrounded by a wooden palisade. And this path that we're actually walking on at this moment actually is on the site of the ditch. As I say, there was a, a dig done here in 98, which I, I saw, and, and the ditch still actually exists. It's carved out of solid stone, and it's right under this path in which we're walking right now. So what does that mean about Bruce's family, about Wallace's family? Um, middle class, I would say. If, if you were looking at it in a sort of modern term, you would say middle class upper middle class, perhaps. So in 1270, it would have looked something like this. On the raised ground was the northeastern corner of a fortified hamlet run by the Wallace family. They were minor nobles descended from the Norman aristocracy. And although they would have thought of themselves as Scottish, they would probably still have spoken French within the family. <laughs> But here's the weird thing. The only record of Wallace's youth tells us that he was taught by monks and was going to be a priest. It's possible, because the church was a traditional option for minor nobility without land to inherit. But the only physical evidence we have suggests Wallace was embarked on a less pious career. We know from the seal that, that was discovered a, a few years ago that, that has a, a, a bow in the middle of it that, that Wallace probably saw himself first and foremost as an archer. Now, that probably didn't mean he was a soldier necessarily. It may have been a bit on the poaching side of things, on the, on the hunting of, of deer. Um, but yeah, he, had, he would have had to make his, his own way. He wouldn't have any lands given to him. And I don't think there's any evidence. In fact, it's pretty clear he didn't have any lands himself. So he's, he's got to make his own way. It's likely then that Wallace was a bit of a tearaway, who came good when history gave him a cause. Once Edward I had his hooks into Scotland, he never gave up. In 1296, after repeated humiliations, his puppet king, John Balliol, rebelled. The Scots assembled an army and raided northern England. It was just the excuse Edward was looking for. He marched north. This is Berwick-on-Tweed. Today it's in England, of course, but seven centuries ago, it was one of the most important and prosperous towns in Scotland. As Edward moved forth, spoiling for a fight with the rebellious Scots, the people of Berwick gave him the perfect opportunity for one. Some English merchants had been murdered here and their goods pillaged by the locals. Edward decided to make an example of them. followed, shocked even the partisan English chroniclers of the time. Edward unleashed thousands of trained killers on an unsuspecting band of lightly armed civilians. There wasn't much resistance. 
You see that Land Rover over there? Well, just beyond it, there was a building called the Red Tower. And some Belgian merchants holed up there, firing arrows, and they killed Edward's cousin. So eventually, he personally ordered their deaths by having them burnt alive. But it wasn't just Edward who wanted blood. Soon the cry rang out from the whole army, Havoc, Havoc, which means plunder, plunder. And it's where we get our word havoc from. There would have been mayhem. The men would have been automatically killed, the women raped first. The chronicles say the slaughter lasted three days and only stopped when Edward saw one of his men hacking a woman to death as she was actually in the process of giving birth. They say that half the population of Berwick was slaughtered and that the River Tweed ran red as the bodies piled in. The massacre at Berwick was just the beginning. Edward crushed the Scottish army, shut up John Balliol in the Tower of London and took the Stone of Destiny, the symbol of Scottish kingship, back to Westminster, where it remained for 700 years. It seemed like total capitulation. The story goes that when Edward was leaving Scotland, he turned to the Earl he was about to put in charge and said to him, Bon besoin fait, qui de merde se délivre. In other words, the guy who gets rid of shit is doing a really good job. Edward thought that he'd got rid of the problem of Scotland. He thought that by conquering the nobles, he was conquering the people. But he was wrong, as William Wallace was about to make very clear. Edward I thought he'd taught the Scots a lesson. But the slaughter at Berwick had exactly the opposite effect. All over the country, spontaneous opposition broke out. Then, in 1297, William Wallace burst onto the scene. But according to the chronicles, it wasn't the public atrocities at Berwick that brought him into the limelight, but a private grudge here at Lanark. The chronicles tell the story of how Wallace fell in love. He saw a maiden at mass here in St Kentigern's church and was instantly smitten. She was Marion Braidfoot from nearby Lamington. The story goes that Wallace carried on a clandestine love affair and eventually married Marion. But the English sheriff of Lanark, William Hesselrig, also had his eye on Wallace's girl. When Wallace got into a skirmish with Hesselrig's men, before they could arrest him, Marion helped him escape into the hills. In revenge and full of lustful hate, Hesselrig had Marion killed. Hearing of the slaughter, Wallace returned under cover of darkness to wreak his revenge. There's hardly anything left of Lanark Castle today. Lanark Thistle Bowling Club occupies the site of Hesselrig's stronghold. Hesselrig wouldn't have expected Wallace to return, but he did. In May 1297, he and his men probably slipped into town in ones and twos and then joined up, ready for their revenge. The attack was swift and terrible. Wallace went straight to the sheriff's house, surprising him in his bed. One blow of his enormous sword went straight through the sheriff's skull, down to his collarbone. Death would have been instantaneous, but a young follower made sure by stabbing the inert body three times. Then the Scottish raiders went on the rampage, killing the English at will, sparing only women and priests. The killing of Hesselrig is the first documented reference we have of Wallace. But the love story may well be fiction. After all, Wallace was an outlaw and the sheriff was the local judge. Maybe Wallace simply killed him to avoid prosecution for some other crime. 
it could be that he was already beyond the law, that he was a, a kind of an outlaw if he'd been poaching, he may even be on, been beyond Scots law. Um, and, and maybe he was someone on the wrong side of the tracks who, who, who sort of made good because war broke out. And because of his success, legends stick to Wallace like glue. He's an archer and he kills the local sheriff. Now, at that time, stories of other fugitive noblemen like Robin Hood were hugely popular. We know that Wallace's maid Marion only appears in later versions of the story. Maybe the chroniclers wanted to turn Wallace into a Scottish version of Robin Hood, and so they gave Wallace his maid Marion too. While we're on the subject of myths and legends, this is probably a good time to admit that Wallace was never called Braveheart. That's the name that belonged to that other Scottish hero, Robert the Bruce, after he died, when his brave heart was put into a casket and carried into battle. Sorry. Wallace's slaying of the Sheriff of Lanark made his reputation. People started flocking to his cause. The outlaw band became a militia and then an army. And at its head, a nobody from Eldersley. Well, that's it. That's the key to it, isn't it? It's the personality of Wallace. I mean, he must have been an extraordinary man. He, we should never have heard of William Wallace, and we wouldn't have done if it wasn't for this war. He obviously had leadership qualities, but I think he also had that single-mindedness, that devotion to a cause, one cause, which in this case was Scottish independence, that meant that he would, you know, there was no other way for him. And I think he's just one of these extraordinary people in, in history that, that do extraordinary things by the, their own personality, not by the situation that they found themselves in. But Wallace wasn't alone. In the Highlands, a young nobleman called Andrew Murray had been fighting an equally successful guerrilla campaign. When Wallace joined forces with Murray, the rebellion became a revolution. The English had to act. Edward I, who was away fighting in France, ordered a formidable army north to sort out the rebels. Barring their way to the Highlands was the mighty River Forth. Wallace and Murray decided to take the English on at the crossing point. Its name was to echo in history. Stirling Bridge. In 1297, the bridge held the key to the strongholds in the Highlands, graphically demonstrated by this 13th century map. If the English were going to take Scotland, they had no choice but to cross. Wallace and Murray decided that a battle at Stirling Bridge was their best chance of defeating the mighty English army. But it wasn't this Stirling Bridge. Amazingly, the exact location of Wallace's greatest triumph was a mystery until recently. Nobody could find the foundations of the original bridge find them and you find the battleground. Then amateur archaeologists decided to test a local tradition that the bridge lay upstream from today's with some homegrown technology. I don't understand how you ever managed to see those pillars under this water. It's pretty murky, isn't it? Well, it is pretty murky, but there are times of the year when the fresh water's coming down and we can see. Um, we used uh, an old method that the pearl fishers used, which was to... Um, make a bucket out of wood with a glass bottom and they could see the, the, the freshwater mussels on the bed of the river. So you put it in and uh, if you like to have a little look over the side. This is it? Uh, this is it. This is the... It's the high bucket. tech, isn't it? Oh, it is. It is. It is. But it's, it's very effective and on a sunny day, um, if you put your head right and exclude the light from yeah. around the edge, it's... Uh, you can get a marvellous vision of the riverbed. So I should be able to see one of the piers down here somewhere? Yes, yes. All I can see at the moment is my yes, face it. looking back at me. <laughs> I've got it. I think this is it. Yep. Wow. Very effective. A simple solution to a problem. It's quite grueling, isn't it? It is, it is. It's, uh, it's uh, not very easy to use, but... River Vision Mark II. 
<laughs> should pay some of this, you might make a fortune. Yes, I never thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> the ancient town seal from Wallace's time shows a flat wooden platform on top of eight stone piers. Everyone had been looking for a bridge that went straight across the river, but you don't need eight piers for a straight bridge. What they discovered was that the piers went across the river diagonally. No one knows why, but it means that the number of piers fits perfectly for a bridge that looks something like this. This narrow structure was a key part of Wallace's plans. The Scots had positioned themselves on the high ground on the north side of the river. In 1297, this is what Wallace might have seen. He and his lightly armed foot soldiers would have had a clear picture of the task that faced them. Looking south to the river, they could see the English as they prepared for battle in the shadow of Stirling Castle. Accounts say that the English had brought a thousand cavalry and 50,000 infantry to face the spears and dirks of the rebels. They outnumbered the Scots by as much as 10 to one. Wallace's men knew it was make or break. The English army at that time was regarded as the mightiest fighting machine in Christendom. Wallace must have been a dynamic leader to have instilled in his men the belief that they could win, uh, not just against superior numbers, but against much more superior armaments, uh, horses, weaponry, even money when it comes down to it. And even although they were outnumbered, Wallace used the land of Scotland itself to help. The fourth looped round, leaving an area of boggy ground between the English and the Scots. This was crossed by a single raised causeway that followed the same course as the road does today. The bridge and this narrow road caused a bottleneck. The logistics of getting the sheer numbers onto the field of battle would have made for a scene like the start of the London Marathon. It made some of the English knights nervous, but as the nobles discussed tactics, the tide rose, making the marshland even boggier. Delays and indecision were to prove fatal. Three times the English started across the bridge and three times they drew back. Dominican friars were sent across to offer Wallace peace terms, but the message came back, we have not come for peace, but to avenge our country. The upstart was spoiling for a fight and the English were happy to oblige. Wallace and Murray couldn't believe their luck. The enemy was about to fall into their trap. The narrow bridge could only take two horses at a time. As the heavily armoured mounted knights rode off the causeway to form a battle line, the ground became too boggy for an effective charge. The English were probably expecting the Scots to wait till they'd all processed across the bridge and lined up nicely. That was the etiquette of chivalry. But Wallace and Murray weren't like that. They were street fighters engaged in a last ditch attempt to save their country. They waited until just the right amount of Englishmen had crossed. Enough to fight and enough to kill. And then Wallace gave a single blast of his horn. The Scots rushed out from their stronghold on the high ground beyond where that white bungalow is. They attacked on both flanks and they cut off the English retreat back to the bridge. With no room to form up and completely unable to manoeuvre, the English were stuck. The Scots slashed at the hamstrings of their horses and stabbed at their underbellies and as the horses fell, the English were dead meat. It was carnage. Chronicles report 5,000 English dead. The victory was against all odds. Native cunning and spirit had defeated numbers, money and equipment. The English retreated in disarray. To this day, Stirling Bridge is symbolic of an unbreakable sense of national pride, whatever the southern neighbours may do. And on the very turf where Wallace's men splashed through the mud to bring down the English cavalry, a new generation of warriors struggle for pride and glory. A bit too low, a bit too low. Break up, break up. Less than that. There is a sense of 
of history here. I mean, I, maybe because I'm also the history teacher as well as the rugby coach, but I sense, and I think the boys feel too, that this is a, an ancient place. It's surprising. When you tell the story of the battle, you could hear a pin drop because there's a sense of pride, there's a sense of uh, achievement that you can sense with, uh, among the pupils. Ah, sure, the, you know, you lose the atmosphere a bit later, but for that moment, there's just, there's something in them that they just feel, hey, yeah, we did this, here. William Wallace was a national hero, but he was now on his own. His partner, Andrew Murray, had been one of the handful of Scottish casualties. Nevertheless, the Scottish tales were up. Wallace decided to take the battle to the English. The next time they saw the Avenging Scot, it was going to be on their own turf. What was William Wallace really like? Well, to the Scots, he was the hero of Stirling Bridge, the 27-year-old victor of the hated English. With his partner, Andrew Murray, dead, Wallace got all the glory. And that success makes the real man harder to find. The ballads and myths started almost at once. The Scottish Chronicles are more celebrations of a legend than objective histories. I think there are various reasons why Wallace is a legend. Wallace represents Scottish national resistance in a most extraordinary way. I mean, this, this was a man who absolutely turned the tide. The English seemed to, seemed to have dealt with Scotland in 1296. The Scottish nobility had capitulated. Um, John Balliol, the king, had miserably abdicated. Um, and, you know, this nobody arose and Scotland rose with him. And, you know, that, that is a tremendous achievement. There's no doubt of that. But anyone who's ever watched a football match with rival fans knows there are always two ways of looking at any incident. The English hated Wallace. To them, he was a terrorist who'd broken the chivalrous rules of war. In football terms, he'd taken the penalty before the keeper was ready. And what happened next seems to confirm that Wallace had a much darker side. Buoyed with his success at Stirling, Wallace swept into Northern England. It was time for the Scots to vent their fury. The English chronicles are full of stories of Wallace's savagery. He put monasteries to the torch and laughed as monks were drowned in front of him. He slaughtered women and burnt schools with the schoolchildren inside. Rape, torture and atrocity marked his progress through the borders. He shocked an age hardened to brutality. The stories evoke contemporary parallels. The English accused Wallace quite explicitly of effectively ethnic cleansing, that his intention was to get rid of everyone that spoke English from the north of England. Even the Scottish chronicles realised there was a problem. They said he tried to prevent the excesses of his men, defending priests at the altar. On the other hand, they made no bones about his hatred of all the English. So was Wallace a national hero or a war criminal? The National Wallace Monument is the great Victorian expression of his legendary status. It dominates the landscape of Wallace's great triumph at Stirling. Braveheart fans and Scots from all over the world, including the South Florida branch of the Stuart clan, come to pay homage. But even here, there's a grim recognition that there was little room for compromise in medieval warfare. And the said provenance executioners would then put this through the back or the front of the head. And that is your cranial spike. If you knew Wallace as a person, he probably wasn't the sort of guy you would like to get on the wrong side of. He was probably terrifying. There was probably enough a lot of people in Scotland that were either feared them or hated them at the time. We see him as a national hero and we see him differently. But Wallace's one major inherent strength was he killed Englishmen wherever and whenever he found them. Is that, is, that was his job and that's what he did. Not to be confused with your dispatching dagger, which has two sharp edges, one to the left 
and one to the right. Essentially, was Wallace was a man of his day. The mortally wounded out of their misery by There's no doubt that he was a very bloody violent man, living in a violent age. And uh, he stood no nonsense at all from enemies and butchered them as soon as look at them. Uh, but at the same time, here's a man that was a leader. People, uh, he was an underdog, a second son of a, an unimportant knight, and yet he had something in him which people responded to. And he led them, he had a vision, he was true to his king, he was fighting for John Balliol, um, he had loyalty, he had a sense of purpose, a sense of achievement, he had a brain that could think of strategy. No, I think there are many good aspects of Wallace's personality uh, and character which you can focus on, but we try to sort of um, say that those days are gone now when we want to uh, slaughter the English. <laughs> On his return from his campaign of terror along the English borders, Wallace was knighted, possibly by Robert the Bruce. Then Sir William Wallace was made guardian of Scotland. In the absence of the king, he'd been given absolute power. Wallace knew the English weren't beaten. He began preparations at once for the defense of the realm. He put a gibbet in every major town to deal with backsliders. Another sign of his ruthlessness, perhaps, or just a desperate recognition of the scale of the expected English response. Pretty soon, the king realised that if he wanted a job done properly, he was going to have to do it himself. Next time Wallace met the English army, it would be led by King Edward. The English wouldn't be fooled by another surprise attack, so to prepare for a clash with the heavily armoured English cavalry, Wallace invented a battlefield tactic called the Shildrum. The outnumbered ranks of infantry would form an enormous circle of spears so that the charging knights would be met by a deadly giant hedgehog. As a massive English army advanced from the south, Wallace retreated, burning fields and crops as he went. His plan was to use a scorched earth policy to break the English lines of supply. It nearly worked. As the English army lumbered on, getting hungrier, there was no sign of the enemy. Then, at Edinburgh, a scout reported that Wallace was just 20 miles away in Falkirk, ready to pounce if the English retreated. Edward ordered a forced march. At dawn, on the 23rd of July, 1298, the English luck changed. The chronicles tell us that as the English army was advancing up the fourth, they saw a flash of armour up here on the hill. It was Wallace spying on his enemy. But by the time an advance guard had raced up here, he was gone. Instead, down there, in front of the town of Falkirk, they could see the entire Scottish army preparing at last for battle. No one knows why Wallace chose to stand and fight. The English were almost out of food and ready to retreat. Perhaps he thought he might be overtaken and preferred to choose the battleground. Or perhaps Stirling had made him overconfident. Either way, the Battle of Falkirk was to be crucial. And yet, incredibly, no one's sure where it took place. The scraps of information we have from the Chronicles just refer to a hilly area overlooking boggy ground and a watercourse. It could have been the town centre site where the park is today. The rise just beyond the supermarket. The farmland under Calendar Woods. Or here, the Mumrill site near the main Edinburgh Falkirk Road. Whatever the location, we know the story of the day. Wallace had his men arranged up on the high ground with four large circles of spearmen, and in between them he had his short bowmen, and behind his cavalrymen ready to charge. I've brought you to the ring, he said to his men. Now dance as best you can. The English sent wave after wave of cavalry across the boggy ground, up the slope, and onto the waiting Scottish spears. But then two things happened that changed the course of the day and the future of Wallace's reputation. Firstly, the Scots nobility, who made up their cavalry, suddenly upped and left. And secondly, the English brought on their new secret weapon, 
the long bow. The longbow's range was deadly. Some thought it went against the rules of war, as horrific in its time as napalm, as effective as a machine gun. Wallace escaped with his life, 10,000 of his men didn't. To be fair to Wallace, he had planned his strategy around what the English normally do, which is a major cavalry charge. And that's why you've got the Shultrams, these this hedgehog of spears. And he had trained his men well on this, and they'd been practicing for, for quite a while. But what he couldn't have foreseen, really, was that Edward would deploy the archers uh, in the way that he did. And this is the beginning of, of the rise of the English archer to such a preeminent position in the Hundred Years' War against France in the next century. They're going to win win battles and poor old Wallace got, was on the receiving end of that. He had planned it, it's just that technology took over. For people who know the movie, it may come as a shock to know that Falkirk wasn't the end for Wallace. He was to carry his fight on for seven more years before his horrific betrayal and death. <laughs> Falkirk was annihilation. Wallace escaped with his life, but a reputation in tatters. His loyal foot soldiers had been slaughtered by English bowmen. And if Blind Harry's to be believed, his cavalry had simply deserted him. Sir John Graham was one of the few nobles who stayed at Wallace's side. His remains lie in Falkirk graveyard, one of only three marked graves from 10,000 dead. Wallace didn't just fight the English, he also fought the threat from his own nobility, uh, possibly because of his low-born status, or low-born compared to the, the great earls of Scotland, who were jealous of, of Wallace's sudden high standing in the community. What are you going to do? Are you going to stay there and die? Or are you going to go away and live to fight again? I mean, it's all very easy for us 700 years over to say, oh, it's a dreadful thing. I don't think the Scottish cavalry could have won that battle. Under no, no, they couldn't have done it. Um, so I think they very wisely said, let's go regroup, try and think again. So but, you don't think the cavalry betrayed? No, I don't. Was. I think they very sensibly saw the way things were going. Um, I mean, they, what could they, what, there's nothing they could have done. What are they going to do? Ride down that hill into the cavalry and be, and be completely massacred? We've got to remember, Wallace himself survived the Battle of Falkirk, unlike a lot of the men in his showtrons. Demoted from his role as Guardian of Scotland and with his troops decimated, it seems Wallace returned to the land he knew best, hiding out in the forests of Selkirk while he regrouped. Edward I had battered the Scots into military submission. When Wallace re-emerges, it isn't as a soldier, but as a diplomat. While he was Guardian, Wallace had been used to playing on the international stage. While so much else has been lost, incredibly, we have one of Wallace's own letters. He was writing to the merchants of Lübeck in Germany, basically saying that Scotland was open for business. Now, in the wake of military disaster, it seems Wallace took the political initiative against the hated Edward. Another letter, which has since been lost, shows that Wallace made journeys to the King of France and to the Pope to try and win political support. It was the equivalent of an appeal to the United Nations at the time. It was a unilateral action, not backed by the nobles, who were trying to appease Edward while they consolidated their position. So do you think that in his later years, Wallace would have been a bit of a political loose cannon like Edward Heath or Arthur Scarborough? <laughs> I think loose cannon is exactly the way to, to describe Wallace. Although he does, when he comes back from the continent in 1303, he does join with the rest of the Scottish nobility. He's one of the leaders of the Scottish army, and that's, that's quite interesting. He's one of many. Um, but when the Scots decide, when John Common of Badenoch is the sole guardian at that period, that Scotland has had enough, um, that perhaps they should submit to Edward, whether they thought this was only a temporary measure uh, or not. 
Wallace could not, would not um, submit. He's not the only one, but he's the main one. Um, and, and I think uh, most of the Scottish nobility and the Scottish people, uh, it's not just the, the nobility, a lot of the Scottish people had had enough as well. Um, they would have thought, oh, shut up. <laughs> but Wallace wouldn't shut up. He fought on in the way he knew best, as an outlaw. While everyone else, including Robert the Bruce, went with the flow, Wallace kept one step ahead of the law went straight to the top of Edward's most wanted list. The shocking thing was when the end came that it wasn't an Englishman that captured Wallace. He was actually betrayed by a Scot who was an English pay. But an awful lot of the problems in Scotland down the century were succinctly summed up by Robert Burns who said we are bought and sold for English gold. In 1305, Wallace was finally betrayed to the English. By this time, most of Scotland's nobles were back under Edward's rule again, and one of his tests of their loyalty was whether or not they were prepared to try to capture Wallace. But eventually the betrayal wasn't just political, it was personal. The man chosen to close the trap round him was Sir John Menteith, a particular friend of Wallace's who was godfather to his two children. They surprised Wallace here at Rob Royston, just outside Glasgow. There was a struggle, eventually Wallace was subdued and dragged south of the border to avoid any possibility of rescue. Seventeen bruising days later, he arrived in London. On the 23rd of August, Wallace was brought before the King's Bench at the Royal Palace of Westminster. This was once the largest freestanding building in Europe. In 1305, it was the intimidating setting for a show trial. Wallace stood silent facing his accusers as charge after charge was read out. He only spoke once when accused of treason against Edward. He shouted out that he could never have committed treason as he had never given his loyalty to anyone but the rightful King of Scotland. But in the end, the odds were stacked against Wallace. The trial was more about humiliation than justice. As he stood on this spot, the sentence for treason was declared. Wallace was to be hung, drawn and quartered. Stripped naked, and with his feet tied to the tails of two horses, he was dragged through the city of London. His head banged against the cobbles. The London crowd pelted him with filth. Miraculously, when he arrived here, he was still conscious. In those days, this was known as Smoothfield. It was just outside the city walls. Today, we know it as Smithfield, the site of the famous London meat market. And here, just round the back of St Bart's Hospital, they butchered William Wallace. Now, in Wallace's case, of course, in, in his hanging, he'd be dangling there, suffocating, going purple in the face, eyes starting out of his head, bloodshot, struggling, arms and legs jacketating. He'd probably be incontinent of urine and faeces, stool. Now, this required great skill on the part of the executioner because he's got to cut him down while he's still conscious, drawn, He'd slash open your belly with a knife, pull out your guts, pick up his knife and crudely hack it away. Toss the guts onto the fire. If he was still the slightest bit alive, he might smell his own intestines burning. And then hack the body open, the, the quartering, probably using an axe. Take out the heart, Cut it out, show it to the crowds. Now the heart would still be beating. Wallace by now would be brain dead. Crowds wouldn't know this, they'd see the heart beating because the heart will go on after brain death, will go on beating for several minutes, perhaps even up to half an hour, well-known phenomenon. Wallace's head was displayed on London Bridge. 
The four parts of his dismembered body were sent to Berwick, Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Stirling, the scene of his greatest triumph, to warn the Scots. And that should have been that. At 35, Wallace had died a failure. His reputation as a military genius had been smashed after just nine months. Then for the next seven years, he'd been powerless to stop Scotland falling under Edward's rule. But like many heroes who die young, his death sealed his immortality. It's Wallace's legacy that's his lasting achievement. Wallace's execution inspired Robert the Bruce to take on his mantle. Nine years later, Bruce invoked Wallace's spirit before the decisive Battle of Bannockburn, which established the independence that Wallace had so long fought for. Almost five centuries later, Robert Burns, who was brought up in the same forests where Wallace used to hide out, was inspired by Bruce's tribute. He wrote Scots Way Hay. It's become Wallace's anthem, a symbol of what he represents. When the foundation stone of the Wallace Monument at Stirling was laid, 70 or 80,000 people turned out in the day to see it. So it meant something to people even back in the days when Scotland was seen as North Britain. And any time that Scotland's future has been called into question, Wallace's shadow is there. A lesser man might have simply given up, but Wallace went on trying, admittedly not very successfully, but he remained absolutely consistent to that, that Scottish cause. And I think, therefore, it's hardly surprising that this man has become a symbol of Scottish nationalism in an utterly justifiable way. He is crucial to the Scottish psyche and to, to how the Scots have felt about themselves. And he is the symbol of unadulterated Scotland. It's a very macho symbol, I have to say. Um, I sometimes wonder what we women really feel about Wallace. Um, but but he's, he's very important as being somebody that we can look up to with no trace of having had any truck with England. But as a man of the people, Wallace came to represent personal freedom, as well as Scottish independence. This is the Wallace Stone at Falkirk, where Wallace is said to have spied on the English. Miners in Scotland used to be bondsmen. 200 years ago, the local miners, released from their serfdom, started a tradition which lasts to this day, of marching here in the name of Wallace, to affirm their status as free men. I came to Scotland in search of a national hero, but the man I found was much more complex and ambiguous than the well-known legendary character with his deeds of daring do. Of course, Wallace was a man of his time. He was a brutal man in a brutal age. But his absolute insistence that no man or group should be able to dominate any other against their wishes makes him for me not just a Scottish hero, but a universal one.